Grab a Bible if you don't have a Bible. Uh, they're on the back. Get one, get 10, get 12, get 20. Take them, hand them out. I don't care. We have tons of them. I will always buy more. Um, that's something that's always going to be a priority here. So you'll always have an opportunity to have a Bible for sure. Uh, but you'll need one because some of what we'll talk about will be on the screens today, but not all of it. You know how this works. I want you looking at the Word more than looking at me, hopefully. So um, you need a Bible. Uh, we have been working through the story of God. Most of y'all know that for, goodness, a year and a half maybe now. Uh, but that's the whole Bible. So we've done a lot, if you think about it. We started in Genesis. Of course, we didn't cover every word. But we've been following the God before creation, through his creation of Adam and Eve, uh, and the entire world, through the path of sin entering the world through Adam and Eve's rebellion and God's promise to Eve in that moment that he would provide salvation for his, not just creation in general, but them particularly, and that that salvation would come from her uh, own body, from her seed, a seed from woman. And we've been following that seed throughout scripture, and we've looked at a lot of events where uh, there's been a battle almost of sin trying to win the day, and yet Christ, or well, yet Christ, but God preserving that seed and that promise through the lineages of people who became nation, and that nation over time. And I'm giving you the quick one. You know this because you know the story. So at the stage we're at, we've come all the way through ups and downs of history until we've come to a point where that seed, that promised child of Eve is alive on the earth. She is, he is born. His name is Jesus. He is the Messiah. Um, he grows up. He is baptized around 30, and he begins to invite disciples into his life to invest in, and for three years he invests in these disciples. And at the same time, he announces the kingdom of God is there. He proves it by healing people, by raising the dead, by doing various miracles, and demons are oppressing him, uh, and, and, and the spiritual battle, I guess you could say, on earth is at an all-time high. And that's what we've been looking at. One of the other things that Jesus has faced and is facing as this goes on is spiritual leaders and kind of the control of the day. So we're going to see some of that today. So today, most important question in the whole wide world, in all of history, who is Jesus? Uh, that's the title today. Who is Jesus? Uh, Santana already read John 8, 31. I won't read it again, but we're going to look at most of John 8. Don't freak out. It's 59 verses. I know that. We're not going to read every one. Uh, we're going to zoom in through. We're going to skim through some and zoom through some. So, but people have attempted to answer this question for millennia all over the world. Who is Jesus? Science, history, archaeology, astrology. Uh, everybody's got opinions. The Discovery Channel, the Sci-Fi Channel. They all have explanations or attempts to try to say who is Jesus. There's a lot of ideas out there. But the real question is this. Did he ever say who he was? A lot of people say he never did. That's completely untrue. In fact, he did quite a few times. We'll look at that today. Uh, Molly and I were watching, were watching TV this week and just... Kind of bored, you know, that bored watching where you're just, just staring blankly at the television. You know, you should go to bed or something, but you're not. And uh, she was flipping through these old uh, carpool karaoke's. And I don't know if you've ever seen this show, but it's where they get celebrities in a car and they do basically karaoke. And it's usually musicians and stuff. It's kind of funny. Molly's amused by it. It bores me, but she's amused by it. But anyway, uh, one particular episode that she found that we were watching had. Um, and most of y'all may not know who this is. Some may. I, I was a huge fan. We, Molly and I saw them live when we first got married. Uh, Lincoln Park and Chester Bennington, the lead singer, is on there. Now, you may not know this, but Chester, the lead singer, is from Chandler, Arizona. Um, I still follow one of the tattoo artists that did all his work. And every year that tattoo artist talks about Chester. And what was weird is we were watching this. It was July 14th when this was filmed, so it was a rerun, but July 14th, 2017. And we were watching him on there knowing that a week later on the 20th, he took his life. Less than a week later on the 20th, he, he, he took his life. Um, they just released their seventh album. And on the show, he's so happy. 
He's like laughing and singing and shouting loud. He's talking about his kids growing up and what he wants them to be. And by name, you know, like a sound like such a loving dad and all. And six days later, he's gone. You know, gone. They won, Lincoln Park won 67 awards, two Grammys. I mean, I, I don't care what you think about what they said. That's not my point at the moment. My point is the success level was off the charts. But he fought depression the whole time, drug addiction, um, watching him like so happy and having so much fun just like days before he's going to take his life. Like we, we could see it on the hind side, on the back side, even talking about his kids. It just made me wonder the whole time, like, who is this guy really? Like what's really going on inside him Be below the surface, you know? And the truth is, we never see what's below the surface of everybody. It just doesn't happen. Everybody's got something below the surface is what I'm saying that nobody sees. Everybody does. One thing I know that everybody has below the surface, whether we show it or not, is sin. Without a doubt. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's in us all. We're all covered in that. The only thing that kept me from the same fate as Chester is realizing that, that there is sin in me and realizing who Jesus is. Those two things are the only thing that kept me from the same fate as him. I mean that. And realizing that Jesus has much more below the surface than we see. But it's not sin. He's God. You know, he, he's God. So here's your point to remember. It's on the sheets. If you grabbed one, if you didn't, that's all right. I always put it up. Um, Becoming a disciple, again, this is not scripture, this is Dave just giving you a, a single thought to center on with this. Becoming a disciple of Christ sets us free because we recognize his identity, we live in his word, and we walk in his light. I don't always do three-point kind of things, but it just worked out real good this way. Um, recognize his identity, we live in his word, and we walk in his light. So you got to know the context. The context is Rome controls and rules the Jewish people. In this particular day, but their spiritual guidance is covered by a group called the Sanhedrin. So I've mentioned them before, but they're kind of like Congress in a sense. Uh, and much like our Congress, they were divided into kind of like we got Republican, Democrat ruling the whole thing. Uh, they have the same thing. They have Pharisees, Sadducees, these two sides that kind of rule. And what they're doing is they're really governing the law of Moses over the people because Rome sure didn't care about any of that. So Rome let them be in charge of that. They kind of govern the law of Moses over the people, just like our Congress. One side of the group was more conservative. One side was more liberal, progressive. One side was real staunchly stuck on a rigid, literal interpretation of Scripture. The other side was on a flexible, progressive, broad interpretation of Scripture. Um, one thing they had in common, they didn't like Jesus. They both opposed him. They both harassed him. Not every single one of them. There were some among them both that believed. But in general, both, both sides opposed him. Uh, but the Pharisees get most of the press in the Gospels. I don't know why. Maybe they were the most bold and didn't mind going after him more. But uh, they get most of the press for the most part. On the day that we're fixing to look at, Jesus and his disciples are in the temple. And this confrontation begins with the Pharisees. Uh, and where they are in the temple is off limits to anybody except Jewish men. So as a result, there's this Jewish crowd of men that's also gathering. So you get the picture, this religious Jewish group who's in the temple of men that have gathered all kind of around this. And the Pharisees are kind of coming at Jesus. And so Jesus has got his disciples there too. So there's times where he may be speaking to the Pharisees. He may be speaking to the whole group. Sometimes it's hard to tell. But just understand that's the group there that's going on as this happens. And the point of debate in this whole chapter is the identity of Jesus. And Jesus flips it back on their identity too. Who, who are you? You're asking who I am, who are you? So two most important questions you'll ever answer. Who is he and who are you? That's it. So let's get into it. Again, I'm skimming. Don't just go with me. Uh, we're going to hop around a little. Uh, you can, the cool part is you'll be like, well, Dave, why'd you skip over this? I didn't, it's right there. You have it. I didn't hide anything from you. You got the Bible. Take it home. Read it. It's okay. Uh, 
Verse 12, we'll start there. Again, Jesus spoke to them and he said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So the, and I'm going to come back over some of this. Let me read and we'll come back and land on a few points here in a minute. But so the Pharisees said to him, you're bearing witness about yourself. Oh, you're claiming this about yourself. Nobody else said it, Jesus. You're, you're, you're bragging on yourself. Your testimony is not true. It's not true. We can't trust that. You're the one that said it. Jesus said, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. And he goes on to talk about his father, God, um, testifying on his behalf as well. Verse 19, they said to him, therefore, well, where's your father? Jesus said, you know neither my me nor my father. If you knew me, key point here, you would know my father also. If you know me, you know him. Verse 25, skipping a little farther. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. Now, it sounds like he's dodging the question. He's not dodging the question. He's saying, I've been telling you this, and you don't want to hear it. Verse 30, as he was saying these things, many people believed in him. Now, this is a first little pause moment because that sounds real good. Awesome, man. People are getting saved. Many people believing in Jesus. But is that enough? In fact, it gets real squirrely here in just a second. Is that enough? A lot of people say they believe in Jesus. Did it ever occur to you that just because somebody says they believe in Jesus, they may not actually be his disciple? Uh, James 2.19. You're probably familiar with it. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe. Even the demons believe in who he is. We've actually seen that because the past two weeks we've talked about demons. Um... There's a Jesus that many people believe in, a lot of people believe in. And this Jesus is great because he says everything that we want him to say. And he does exactly what he, we want him to do. And he hates exactly who we hate. And he loves exactly who we love. Pretty much does, he looks just like us, <laughs> which is the polar opposite of what the Bible says we're supposed to do. We're supposed to look like him. The, the complete opposite. There's an epic difference between believing in that Jesus and knowing who he really is. You know why? Because when you know who he really is, it's going to cause a life-altering crash in you. If you run into the real Jesus and you know the real Jesus, it is going to wreck you somewhere. It has to. It's going to cause a life-altering change in you. Uh, and that's going to be because when you run into him, you realize who you are. You realize who you are. Um, language in the Bible. Being crucified with Christ. Think about how Christ was crucified. Picture it for a minute. If that happened to you, would you look different? <laughs> Not being funny. Would you act different? Crucified with Christ. Things like becoming a new creation. The old is passed away. New creation. Something that didn't previously exist. If those things have happened to you, it's going to be noticeable, right? It's going to be noticeable. There's going to be something that people see and they're moved by. Dark stains are suddenly white as snow. Arrogant people are suddenly very humble. Self-centered people are are suddenly pouring out their selves in service to others, even people they don't even know. Like, there is a dramatic difference. Suddenly, you're not about your own gratification. You're about, how can I love you, even if it costs me everything? People are going to be like, what happened to you? Something, something changed. John the Baptist put it this way in John 3.30. He said, I must decrease he must increase when you run into jesus you want everybody to see more of jesus quit looking at me i don't want you to see me look at him look at him you know john back in john 8 verse 31 jesus look what he says says to the jews who had believed so to those ones who had just believed in him he said if you abide in my word and you're going to see this constant thread in here of my word 
Jesus is saying, my word. Think about that a minute. Who does that make him out to be when he says, my word? If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, we're the offspring of Abraham. We're descendants of Abraham is what they mean. We've never been enslaved to anybody. How do you say you'll become free? And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin, lives in sin, uh, practices to make better. If you practice football, you practice football to make better. This is not talking about, hey, I sin, I struggle with sin, or even I struggle with sin. Maybe you've got a sin in your life that you are desperate to be free of, and you, you, you find yourself going back to it. That's not the same thing here. Practicing means you're in a lifestyle where you enjoy it and you want to get better at it. Why have one woman when I can have four? Why have four women when I can have eight? Whatever it is, you know? Why just do drugs when I can sell drugs and make money? Whatever it is, it's saying you practice sin. You're a slave to it. The slave doesn't stay in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free of sin, that's the context of sin, you'll be free. Verse 37, I know that you are offspring of Abraham. Yet you want to kill me because, again, my word finds no place in you. Now, he just said that to those who claim to believe. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. And he goes on to explain who that is, the devil. I mean, if you think Jesus was just all love, happy, joy, handing out flowers and kissing cheeks, you're crazy. He literally tells these people their daddy is the devil to their face, to their face, knowing they want to kill him. I would say that's provoking at the least. Verse 43, why don't you understand what I say? This is a rhetorical question because here's the answer. It's because you can't bear to hear my word, my word. It irritates you. It makes you angry. You can't bear to hear it. Verse 47, whoever is of God hears the words of God. See that one there? The words of God. The reason why you don't hear them is you're not of God. Verse 48, the Jews answered him, are we not right in saying you're a Samaritan? You got a demon. Jesus said, I don't have a demon. I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I don't seek my own glory. There's one who seeks it and he's the judge. He's saying God seeks my glory. Verse 51, truly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, there it again, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know you got a demon because Abraham died and all the prophets died. Everybody in influential in our past has died. Yet you say, if anybody keeps my word, he's never going to taste death. So, I know there's more. We'll get it. But let's come back and let's look at these points really quick that I mentioned before. Two things to look at. Who is Jesus and what does that mean for us? The great philosopher Alice Cooper recently said, and if you didn't know this, I know there's, we can debate this all day long. I don't really care. Uh, he's a Grew up a believer, lived the crazy life that he did for a long time, and has returned to Christ in his advanced age, but he said this just recently, when Jesus opens your eyes and you finally realize who you are and who he is, it's a whole different world. Hell's not a party. I don't think that we accept Christ. I think that we accept the fact that he has accepted us. Uh, that's legit. Like when you run in, he's talking about when you finally see who he is, Man, you realize who you really are, and everything changes. Look at verse 50. I don't seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Think about that a minute now. Who is he? The Father seeks glory for the Son. The Father seeks glory for the Son. You may not think that's a big, a big deal. Let me give you one verse. I could give you a bunch, but I'll give you one. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord. And when you see it, like I got it here on the board with all caps, your Bible has L-O-R-D, all caps. That's the proper name of God. I am Jehovah, Yahweh, we say. That's the proper name when your Bible all caps it like that. So I am, I am is what this verse is saying. That is my name. Look what he says. My glory I give to no other. 
I don't give my glory to anybody else. Only me. So Jesus is now saying that God is, the Father is glorifying him. Well, that seems contradictory to Isaiah 42, 8 and numerous other verses that say the same thing. Look back in John 8, verse 53. They said, are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Look what he says here in verse 53. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus said, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me. See, he's saying it again. Of whom you say, he is our God. The one you call God, he's glorifying me. But you don't know him. I know him. If I were to say I didn't know him, I'd be a liar like you. (laughs) Listen to him, man. But I know him and I keep, now look, his word. So you've had Jesus saying my word. You've had the word of God. And now you have his word. They're all together. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and he was glad. And Jesus seems confusing here. But he's actually explaining something that can only be accepted by faith. One minute he's talking about God the Father and him as the Son. And there's this sense that they're entirely separate, two completely different people. And there are, quote, religions that teach that, right? Um, he's acting as though he's obeying the wishes and directions of his father as the good son and servant, uh, you know, in that sense. And he is, that's true. But he doesn't leave it there. He also makes himself equal with God. Like saying he's sharing his glory. Like saying my word. And in verse 47, he calls his own word God's word. Saying he came from God. He says he's sinless all in this chapter. But God's word said God has no equal. So is Jesus possessed? Is he blaspheming? In fact, that's exactly what they just accused him of, right? And they continue to ask him to explain, who are you claiming to be? And he finally clarifies it outright. So write this one down because if anybody ever says, Jesus never said who he was. Yes, he did. As black and white as it can be or as red, if your text is in red as it can be. John 8, verse 57. So the Jews said, you're not even 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Literally, that name of God that I just read to you a second ago. And they know it because look what they do. They pick up stones to throw at him. He's calling himself God. We're stoning him right now. He's not just calling himself God. He's calling himself the proper name of God. Quickly, I'll give you a few verses. They'll be on the screen. You can just note them. Exodus 3, 13 to 14 is when this all started. And we studied this way back when in our story of God. Verse 13, Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, Hey, the God of your father sent me to you. (laughs) And they say, oh, really? What's his name? What do I say? God says to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. So that's the name. I am. That's what Jesus just said he was. Before Moses ever heard about it, before Abraham ever heard about it, he is I am. That's what he just said. Isaiah 41, 4. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, all caps. I, I am the first and with the last, I am he. In Revelation, Jesus describes himself as the first and the last. Isaiah 43, verse 10. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know And believe me and understand that I am he. I am he. Before me, no God. Before me, by the way, means in my presence. In my presence. In my presence, no God was formed, nor shall there be any who come after me. I, I am, I am. And besides me, there is no Savior. You know how many texts in the New Testament call Jesus the Savior? I don't. I probably should have counted, but there's a bunch. I've looked a handful of them up. There's a lot. That, but, but here, I am, says there is no Savior besides me. 
John 14, 6, we'll we'll ratchet it up with this one. There's so many we could go into. But John 14, 6, Jesus says, and you probably know this verse, and we've talked about this a little before, but I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Sounds like they're separate in a sense. But verse 7, if you knew me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Don't blow past that. Jesus is telling his disciples, from here on, you're going to realize who I really am. You have now seen the Father by seeing me. He goes on. Philip says, okay, cool, man. Lord, show us the Father, and then we're good, man. And Jesus says, Philip, man, have I been with you all this time? And look what he says. You still don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you understand what he's saying? Think of the implications of what he's saying. So let's look at a few verses that make it practical for us. There's no question who he is. He is God. No question. Who is Jesus? Out of his own mouth, he is God, the highest God. How can he be both the son and the God, the God in the sense of the I am, the Trinity? How is that even possible? I have no idea. That don't change the fact that I believe it. In a dumb way, I don't know how any of this electronics work. Thank God for David. Thank God for Rick. This is just a dumb little thing. But I don't know how any of this works. I certainly can't make a universe. So it's okay that God is a little beyond our grasp of understanding. It's okay. I'm not explaining how he is this way. I'm telling you he is this way. Because he says he is. So few verses make it practical knowing him recognizing who we are but as i mentioned becoming a disciple of christ sets us free from sin because we recognize his identity but then we live in his word and we walk in his light look at verse 24 and we'll finish up really quick here uh i told you that you would die in your sin for unless you believe that i am he you will die in your sins this is the same language being used back by isaiah of i am He says, I am he. Luke 7, verse 48 and 49 says, and he says to this woman, and you can look the story up in your own time, your sins are forgiven. Then those who are at the table with him began to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Who is this that even forgives sins? Like it's one thing to heal somebody, but you can't forgive sin. Why not? Because the only person who can forgive sin is the one who was sinned against. If... You know, if Josh sins against Maggie, I can't forgive Josh. Maggie has to. So for Jesus to forgive sin means Jesus is saying, I'm the one sinned against, which makes him out to be God. And he does forgive. And he does forgive. Look at verse 34, John 8. Jesus answered him, truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. But, verse 36, if the Son sets you free, you're free. In our days, man, practicing sin has become like this banner. And hell has become this big goal for people for whatever reason. And religion's like this trophy for the ignorant. Only dumb people would believe in religion. You know, we got it all figured out. And it all sounds powerful and strong. But the irony is, all of those things are already the case. There's nothing powerful or strong about that. That's already the way it is. You gain nothing from that. It's already reality. We're already lost in sin. That's already the case. We, hell's already our destiny. It's already the way it is. You know what I mean? That don't mean nothing. And religion's always been abused by ignorant people. But look, Christianity is at its core, at its truth, is not a religion, it's a relationship. It's a relationship. It's knowing somebody, one who's going to provide freedom from all of those chains that hold us in sin, that guarantee us hell. He's going to provide freedom for that. Knowing him grants you that. Freedom from the, the destiny that we all face of hell, but also the hell we live in right now. And and maybe you don't feel like this place is so bad. And maybe it's not at times. But I'm telling you, it's 
gets way better. It gets way better. Verse 51. Truly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he'll never see death. What does that mean? Eternal life, right? No spiritual death and physical death can't keep you. Well, Jesus, that's a bold statement. How can you guarantee that? How did he guarantee that? Easter, right? Went to a grave and beat it. You think I'm wrong? Watch me, is what he said. Think I'm wrong? Watch me. Went to a grave and beat it. But it says that that is for those who keep my word. Keep means that you conform to. You conform to. Does it mean that you're perfect? No. It just means you're being shaped by his word. You are com- your life is a process of conforming to what his word says. That's what it means. Look at verse 31. The Jews, or So Jesus said to the Jews who believe him, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Again, truly my disciples because many believed in him. He's trying to identify who a true disciple is. Jesus' focus here is his word. It says his word reveals truth. And the truth revealed in the word is not some kind of special knowledge. It's not like some kind of secret spiritual high. It's knowing a person. That's the truth. And that person will set you free. Not free from limits or restrictions. Not free to have more wisdom than everybody else. Free from sin. It's, it's, it's that basic. Free from sin and death. And there's only one way to truly be his disciple and know that truth here. And that's to live in his word. Not in social media. God love it. Not on YouTube. God love it. Not in the news. Not in the internet. Not in all of that. In his word. In his word. Right there. The same book. Right there. In his word. That's it. That's the reason why I focus on preaching his word. Because only his word has the power to change lives. I can persuade you with all kinds of great arguments. I can shout, yell, stomp, and blow snot rockets and what the crud ever else. You know, I can do all that. But it won't matter. And maybe it changes your mind for a minute, but what if I was wrong? I've screwed us both up. Or what if I was right, but you stick with it a minute and don't care anymore? None of that matters. This changes lives. That's what he's saying. This changes lives. I need this as bad as you do. We all need this. I'm here in this because it changes lives. And keep in mind, keep this in mind. Jesus is saying this to the Pharisees. The experts in Scripture, the ones who quoted the Bible, quote unquote, the Bible, all the time, probably had the Old Testament memorized. So for him to say this, he's talking to people that know the word but can't bear to hear his word. You know anybody that can throw out Bible verses left and right, but when it comes to Jesus, all of a sudden it's getting funny? Now we're going to talk about something else. Now we're going to talk about personal things, or we're going to talk about whatever else. They can't bear to hear his word. So when you truly get a taste of the word of God, though, you don't want to hear about popular topics. You don't want to hear about my stories. You don't want to hear about current events. You don't want to hear long illustrations. You just want more of the word. Man, please give me more of that. Like, I really want more of that. I want it. Jesus, tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. And the opposite's also true. If you don't know him, you want anything else but that. Anything else but that. He says, if you abide in, not just read or quote it, not just listening to a pastor when you go to church at times. Abide means live in. You jump in that pool and you swim around there until you're a fish. Until you don't want to get out anymore. You... you You live in it. Live in it. And if you do that, it says if, so you have a choice. You don't have to. But if you do, it changes everything. And people will see that. There'll be evidence that something is different. Man, this guy's hungry for Jesus, and he's in his word all the time. Do your words, it's really easy to figure this out. Do your words and your deeds reflect Jesus' words and deeds? Who 
take, take a minute and think about it. Grade yourself or grade, you know, grade, grade, grade the situation. Does, does the things coming out of my mouth sound exactly like the things that came out of Jesus' mouth? You know? Do, do, could you easily see Jesus doing that exact same thing? Could you easily see Jesus saying that exact same thing? You know? Abiding means you live there. You live in him. John 15, Jesus compared it to a branch and a vine. Think about the vine or, or, you know, think about a tree limb connected to the tree. That's the picture of living in him, like abiding in him. Lastly, verse 12, we're done here. Again, Jesus spoke to them and he said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Light there is aligned with life and it's opposed to darkness which is death because light and life go together so darkness and death would go together christ is the light of that life he says within us that guides us through absolute darkness of sin and death that's what he's saying you ever been out in the forest and i'm not talking about the desert you were just talking about this in the canyon it's that way in the i've been there i know uh but it, I'm not talking about the desert. You get out in the desert at night and all the stars are out and the sun, the moon's out and it's just all so lit up and everything. Uh, I'm talking about in, in the forest where the trees are tall and they're high. Uh, and if you've ever, ever been out there at night, I mean, the trees just shut out the sky. You can't see anything. Darkness gets to this level of darkness that is uh, frightening. It, uh, it becomes disorienting really quickly and sounds get amplified suddenly screeching owls are loud as can be suddenly every branch that breaks has you jump in you, you, you're seeing eyes in the darkness you're hearing uh wolves howl whatever i i, I don't know when, the wind shifts the trees or just the whole environment begins to close in on you and it gets really creepy uh but if you got a flashlight like, you might still be a little scared, but that calms you right down. Just all you do, turn that light on. It just calms you a bit. Because now suddenly you can see what's there. And you can see the path that's in front of you. You can see the landmarks that are around. You might even say, oh, that's where I came in here from. And you can figure out your way back out. Just that little bit of light. You know what I'm saying? And that's what Jesus is saying he is. He's that light. It's a warning to others in a sense, too. It's to predators that might be there that suddenly you know, struck by light. And also to others who might be lost in the woods, too, that are trying to find, oh, there's a light over there. You know, it's bigger than just for you. He's the light. He's the light that belongs to those who follow him. And hearing his words, understanding them, living by them, stepping where he steps, your path is illuminated. It's lit right in front of you. Yes, there's sin all around. Yes, there's darkness all around. But your path is lit, man. And that light always stays on if you stay in his word. If you stay in his word. Let me close this up, man. If you guys will stand up with me. And um, they're going to come back up. We're going to do one more song like we always do. And uh, I'm going to pray for us here really quick. But I I just want to challenge you to think. If you believe in Christ in the room already, do you feel free? I think sometimes maybe we don't. I don't know. Do you feel free? Maybe it's time to evaluate your walk. Just saying. Where's the word in your life? Is it in your life or are you getting it one day a week? Where's the word in your life? That's where it starts. And and listen. There's one question that we all have to answer, though, and that is, who is he? And if you're not a Christian in this room or you haven't answered that question, you've got to answer it. You're going to find out. I don't want you to find out. I want you to know him. I want you to realize who he is, Savior of the world. That includes you. And when you realize that, you realize who you are. God, man. I'm sick of wrestling with this. I'm sick of carrying this weight. I'm sick of carrying this burden. I want a savior. I want a relationship with the creator. I want to know him. 
I want to be free. Bad. When you feel how ugly and painful sin is, that's all you can think about is I want this off of me. I want this off of me. And Jesus said, I will take it, nail it to my own body, and leave it in a grave. You have that opportunity today if you don't know him. Let me pray. Lord, I pray today that if there's anyone here today that hasn't given their life to you, I pray they do it today. Their own words, no magic phrases, no repeat after me's. Lord, just let them have a burden in their heart to tell you exactly how they feel. To surrender. To recognize that though we can't explain it all, we trust who you are. And we know who we are. Lord, thank you that in Christ, in you, we are a new creation though. That when we make that decision to lay our lives in your hands, Lord, we can celebrate. We can be excited because we have the light. We can see where we're going. We know what's going on. We have your word. We have understanding. We have, Lord, we, we have protection. We have guidance. And best of all, we have a destiny. Man, that even the grave can't take from us. Lord, I love you. I thank you for your word today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.